All right, thanks. So um, this talk is about the interplanetary file system. It's actually about um, a graduate project that I, I've been working on as part of my master's degree. Um, uh, I'll provide a brief introduction to what IPFS is, uh, followed by some results uh, from uh, from a controlled study that I did um, on the on the block size and how that affects performance and such. <clears throat> Um, I created a multi-node multi IPFS-like network uh, for testing how block size affects the performance and space optimization. I'll uh, present on the uh, conclusions that, I, that were drawn um, at the end. So like I said, first off, I'm going to uh, provide you with a summary of the interplanetary file system. Then I'll do an introduction of blockchain and Merkle distributed acyclic graphs. <clears throat> and then we'll uh, discuss um, my simulated interplanetary file system and uh, conclusions um, from the simulation. So let's start with a simple summary of what an interplanetary file system is. Uh, some of you may already know, but for those who don't, I'll go over that today. Afterward, we can discuss the various components. So let's start with establishing what it's not. <laughs> the interplanetary file system has nothing to do with planets and interplanetary communication of any sort, despite the name sounding like it does. And I get, uh, anytime I talk to someone about this, I, I always get that question, of what does it have to do with that? And the answer is supposedly, IPFS lends its name from the Intergalactic Computer Network, um, which the Intergalactic Computer Network was proposed by JCR Like Leader of ARPA in the 1960s. And this term was later shortened to the better no known name, the Internet. So the name Interplanetary File System is actually a way of paying homage to the original naming of the Internet. So nothing to do with anything more interesting. <laughs> I can see you guys commenting in the chat. Yes, I know it's very disappointing. It's not nearly as interesting as it sounded. <laughs> so in a broad sense, IPFS is just many interconnected nodes which store file blocks. <laughs> um, and unlike the internet, IPFS does not have clients and servers, but only interconnected nodes talking to each other. Um, nodes communicate with each other to transfer file blocks and each file and subsequently each block in the file is represented by a cryptographic hash. Directories are represented by hashes of the directory's contents. Uh, each file or directory is, re is recorded by the node in a Merkle um, uh, a DAG, similar, which is similar to a Merkle tree. Uh, DAG again is a directed Cicillic graph. Um, and it's stored with a, a cryptographic hash of each block representing the leaves of the tree. <clears throat> a blockchain is used to track file blocks that are added to the file system. And the use of blockchain makes the files in the tree persistent. So I'm going to provide a, a brief introduction to blockchain technology. Um, since blockchain is the basis for the persistence of the interplanetary file system. Uh, yes, uh, Giovanni, um, Git also uses a, a, Mer a Merkle DAG um, to store history. So that's a good example. Um, the blockchain demo I'm going to show you is taken from um, Anders Brownworth. He provides a really excellent visual demonstration of blockchain. I uh, thought this would be useful. Um, so first, I'll introduce you to what a block is. Now, just to, to clear up some confusion ahead of time, um, during this presentation, I'll talk about two different types of, blo types of blocks. Um, there's the block in the blockchain for storing, uh, for storing hashes of, of, um, of, the blo of file blocks. So we're talking about both blocks in the blockchain and bl uh, file blocks from files. And I'll make sure I point out when I'm talking about one or the other. So a block contains three sections. It has a block number, a nonce, 
uh, which I'll explain in a moment and, and the need for that. And then of course the data. Um, uh, you'll notice that the hash of this data starts with four zeros right here. And those four zeros mean that this block is signed. Now, if I uh, if I change any part of the block, so I added some some text in the data there, such as typing in the data section, you'll notice that our hash is no longer signed, which is indicated by the block turning red in the demonstration. And in order to make our hash signed again, we can modify our nonce and uh, and set the nonce to any arbitrary number. But we need to try to set it to a nonce that makes our hash start with four zeros again. Um, and we would start with a nonce of one and then iterate over every possible nonce until we found one that caused it to be signed. After iterating over many nonces, um, in a demonstration, you click this mine button, it does it for you. Uh, we eventually find a nonce that matches our conditions and now our block is signed again. And now let's talk uh, about what a blockchain looks like. Uh, so here's a blockchain. It only has three blocks in it. Uh, you can see block one looks similar to our block from before with a block number, a nonce, and some kind of data. But you'll notice that in addition, the block now has a previous hash. Now in our example, the previous hash on the first block is just all zeros. Looking at block two, you notice that the previous hash is the hash from block one. And the block three's previous hash here is the hash from block two, and et cetera. So let's try modifying the data for block three. You'll notice just like before that our hash becomes invalid for that block. And of course, we could mine for a valid hash to correct this. But instead, let's reset it. And um, let's see what happens if we instead modify block, uh, the second block in the chain. Our hash for block two becomes invalidated as expected, but because block three uses the hash of block two for its previous hash, now it is also invalidated. <clears throat> Modifying any block anywhere in the chain will invalidate all of the following blocks in the chain. For example, if we had a block or a chain of 10,000 blocks and we modified block seven in the chain. Blocks seven through 10,000 would, would now be all invalid. Every block before seven would still have a signed hash, but everything else would be broken. And in order to fix our blockchain at that point, we would need to remine every block from seven to 10,000, one at a time, to correct our nonce for each block. Therefore, the further, black in, uh, the further back in the chain we go, the harder it will be to modify the chain. Uh, this is how a blockchain becomes persistent, or part of it anyway, and as, and what makes it not easily modified. So next, let's talk about a distributed blockchain. We know we can still modify our blockchain, as I showed before, but we also know that it can be very, and, and we know it can be very difficult to modify. So how do we guarantee that it doesn't change? So imagine we're storing bank transactions in the chain, just like in, um, in uh, Bitcoin. Uh, Shouldn't we provide some kind of guarantee to our customers that no one is going to steal their money other than that it's just really hard? <laughs> we need to provide some more um, con concurrency. So this is where we introduce the idea of a distributed blockchain. We Here we have, I, I show you, if there's four peers uh, labeled A through D and each maintain a copy of the blockchain. Now, let's say peer B is actually a malicious actor and decides to steal a bunch of money and transfers everyone's money to their account, which would seem pretty foolish because obviously somebody would notice. But <laughs> if we, uh, now afterwards, peer B remines all of his blocks, three through five, so they appear to be correctly signed and valid. So how do we know that peer B has modified the chain? It says now all the hashes appear valid on his chain. And the way to check is if we look on, uh, uh, closely at block three on peer B, we'll just see that his hash is actually incorrect. It doesn't match, although it's a valid signature, it doesn't match the hashes of peers A, C, and D. 
<clears throat> so all of the hashes um, following block three on peer B um, chain is all, are also wrong, and none of them will match. Now, to simplify things, all we need to check for is to verify that the block uh, to blo verify that blockchains match is to ver is, is whether the very last hash on the chain matches. So if if the 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 hash the very last hash in the chain is wrong on a peer, then we could evict that peer from the distributed blockchain since we know that the chain has been modified. Because if a single hash on, at the end is wrong, then, the, then uh, we can't trust anything in the chain. <clears throat> now let's talk about um, a Merkle distributed acyclic graph or uh, Merkle DAG for short. Merkle DAGs are similar, similar to Merkle trees, but there are no balance requirements and every node can carry a payload, which is important for IPFS. Um, so here's an illustration of a 17 megabyte file chunked into 262 kilobyte chunks and arranged in a Merkle DAG. Every, uh, this is an IPFS illustration, of course. Um, every node in the Merkle DAG is the root of a sub Merkle DAG. In IPFS, requesting the hash of any subnode in the Merkle DAG will produce the contents of all of the node's children, so meaning a subset of the file contents. So uh, like I said in, a second ago, um, a, uh, every, every node um, can, uh, can contain data. So, so if you request a, any subnode, it will give you a subset of the file. So for example, if I were to upload a video to, um, to IPFS, I could request a subset of the video and play it. Well, if it's a, a possibly, <laughs> I mean, if I request like the first block, I could play that first block and then it would end where the uh, where it, it cut off. I've done that just to test it out. So you can so you can literally download sub blocks of a file uh, of a file. Now this is useful if, like for I like I mentioned, if you're streaming video content and you don't want to um, request all the blocks at once or uh, there, are, there are other uses. You can distribute large um, databases and stuff across um, multiple nodes, et cetera. <clears throat> okay. So the ideas, IDs of the leaf nodes are the hash of each chunk uh, 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 in, the, in the, of the file. And the IDs of parent nodes are hashes of the combinations of the children. So the idea of the root of the tree, for example, is a hash of the entire file. Uh, the Merkle DAG is constructed from the leaves first, from top, or from bottom to top. Uh, so parents are added after children because children's IDs must be computed in advance in order to link them. So in order to simulate an interplanetary file system, I implemented a small subset of it for testing. Um, I used Hyperledger Aroha to provide a really simple blockchain for just for storing hash persistence for um, uh, for for my uh, distributed blockchain. And to store um, the the Merkle DAG, I used a Samba uh, Samba's TDB project, which is a really simple database for storing key value pairs. And I also just designed. A simple packet specification for for how my IPFS client and server would communicate. Um, some simplifications that I made: um, the IPFS nodes in my simulation do not swarm, meaning individual nodes don't, uh, aren't are connected manually through uh, computer, manual configuration. Um, in a, a real IPFS network, um, the uh, uh, the nodes can uh, do what's swarming, and they they connect to each other um, automatically, and they search for uh, for um, nodes in the that are uh, available. Um, the simulation also does not provide the interplanetary naming system. Obviously, that would be well beyond the scope of this project. Uh, so I so my my simulation can't rename or modify uh, files. It can upload a new copy of a file with a different name, etc. But um, anyway, so Hyperledger Aroha, this is a simple blockchain provided by the Hyperledger project. Um, I chose this because of how small it is. Um, it's designed to be really easy to deploy and simple to implement. 
it took very little configuration. Um, it, it provides various language bindings, which made it really straightforward to update the ledger. I, I bound to it with the, with some uh, with their Python bindings and was able to simply update the ledger and, and pull information from it. So just the simplicity of this project made it really easy um, uh, to use in the simulation. Um, <clears throat> so I chose to store the Merkle DAG and a TD D database um, due to its simplicity to use. It's just a single file, uh, stores simple key value pairs. Um, yeah, it's a really simple database. It's created by the Samba team, which I'm on the Samba team, and so it would just seem natural because I already know how to use it. <laughs> I'm sure there are better ways to do this, but uh, this was the simple uh, solution for me. Um, an advantage to using a TDB database is both in its simplicity and also ability to share between multiple readers and writers at the same time, which I needed to be able to do um, because uh, I had a client and server on each host talking to the same database at the same time. Because when you request a block, the a, each node needs to know whether or not it's ar it already has that block. And um, so the server uh, the server's part on the on the node um, needs to be able to check if it has a block so that it can serve it or or add blocks to the uh, to the database. And then the client needs to uh, if um, the client receives a uh, um, a request, it needs to be able to um, see if the data is there also. So so they they use the same database. Um, okay. So I wrote this really simple packet transfer specification. I, I wanted to implement the uh, the same way IPFS does, but it was kind of complex. And when I went to talk to people in the community and and look for documentation, there really was no documentation at all. Rather than read all of I, the IPFS source code and figure out how it worked which was well beyond the scope of what I was doing. I decided to just write my own simple packet specification and I'll just go over it really quick here. Um, <clears throat> so uh, here's a simple, uh, analogy, or, sorry, a, a, a simple a, uh, a view of, what it, uh, of how it works. So it primarily consists of, of LS and cat requests and responses. A basic file request would start with an LS request to the simulated IPFS server. The server would then respond with a list of block hashes based on the file requested. The client then would send um, cat requests for the contents of each block, which the server fetches from the TDB database here um, and responds to the client. So each simulated packet begins with a header to identify the type of packet as IPFS. Also identify the command being sent or received. There is a flag to indicate where the pa whether the packet is a request or response packet. And there is also a signature uh, field for verifying the, authentic plah, the authentic authenticity of the sender. Can't talk today. Um, an LS packet looks like this, a request. It begins, uh, basically, uh, you, you, uh, you append a packet header and say what it is, and then you just you dump a 46-byte um, hash, which is the size of an IPFS hash. And then the packet response actually varies in size. After first specifying the header, you indicate the number of LS list objects, which is I'll define in a second. Um, and each of those, and, and the, it, they're packed into a variable length buffer. Um, each um, object contains a, a size, a, um, a size of the object, a type, whether it's a directory file or a block, a hash for the object, and, and then a, a variable length file or directory name. If the object is a block, obviously the, the, the um, name length will be zero, and then there's no file name appended. Um, and then a, here, this is what a cat request looks like. Basically, you just send a you, with a header file. Or you, you send it with a header and then a um, a, a hash of the block or file that, uh, uh, for the contents you're requesting. Technically, you could send a a directory hash, but I don't think it would be useful to cat the entire contents of a directory all concatenated together. Maybe there's a reason for that. I don't know, but you could send the hash of a 
of a directory also. Um, our, our cat re response just returns a variable length buffer containing the contents of the file or block requested. Um, if you request an entire file at once, it's going to be a ginormous packet. <laughs> so better to request packets or blocks, individual blocks. Um, uh, an add request is something else that I, I added so that I could upload data for testing. Um, it add, this is to add blocks and files uh, and directories to the server. Uh, it comes in three different forms in this specification here. When you add a single block, the variable, uh, the data variable contains the contents of a block and the name field is empty. When adding a file, the name is specified and the data variable contains a list of children nodes, which it needs to assemble into a tree. And a directory add is similar, except the list of children are file hashes. You also notice there's a parent hash value. Um, this is really irrelevant to real IPFS. I added this only for testing, so I could nest all of the test uploads that I'm doing under a specific hash that I could easily um, uh, pull up. And so you can ignore that. Um, the uh, For a block add, the add response provides a hash of the block sent to the add re uh, request. Um, for a file or directory add response, the response hash is the top level hash of the Merkle DAG created by assembling a tree from the node specified in the add request. Okay, now for the results. Um, these results are from running a series of tests against the size of an IP IPFS block. So I, I modified this, the actual size of the data block, um, so the, the contents of a file. So uh, this is the size that we're chunking the uh, the the file into, and when uh, so when I'm referring to the block size here in this upcoming uh, uh, slides, I'm referring to actual file blocks that that I've chunked up, not blockchain blocks, of course. Um, <clears throat> so what did I test? I um, I did some load testing um, by varying the the block size. Uh, each modification with each modification of the block size that I did block size, um, I tested for upload time, download time, ledger update time, which is the um, the uh, Aroha uh, ledger, and the uh, size of the the Merkle distributed acyclic graph. It really really doesn't like that slide. Okay, well what was on that page? And probably is the reason for this is a large test file. <laughs> I don't know if you guys saw it all. Did it, was anybody able to see the image that was supposed to be on there? Yes, eventually we did. It took a little while to load, but it, it got there. Okay, so my my um, uh, my browser apparently really doesn't like it. I'm just using Chrome, but anyway. So so that's the test. That was the test image that I that I was testing with, and it's really high resolution. But there's a lot of duplicates inside of it. Um, so, so the test file was um, 17 megabytes in size. I mean, large for a standard file, I guess. Um, I chose it because of the high resolution and because of uh, the um, because of the block duplication. Um, all right. So, so this slide now. Uh, probably the most interesting result was how the block size affected the size of the the Merkle distributed acyclic graph. Um, the table here shows the size of the Merkle DAG going vertically, and then uh, horizontally, that is the block sizes. Um, horizontally, yeah. The the rapid oscillating here um, uh, is the size of the uh, in the size of the Merkle DAG is actually an implementation detail. So I believe what's happening is that the TDB database is pre-allocating more space than I'm requesting. So these um, these lows here are are what's really interesting. Um, let's move on. Uh, so if we ignore those peaks in the oscillating, uh, since this indicates empty allocated data, um, the information uh, that's really interesting is in the the red line that follows the bottom of the uh, the, the valleys. Let me. Move things here. 
got to rearrange my page here since I got kicked out. Okay. So now if I Im eliminate the that oscillation and just show the, the, the valleys, then it reveals a more, uh, a more interesting pattern. Um, to the left of the graph, you see the, the Merkle DAG grows exponentially in size to the left as our blocks become very small. Uh, so this is due to the amount of overhead required to create the, the Merkle DAG. Uh, the smaller the blocks, the more tree nodes we have. Um, so, so let me explain that. Uh, I think, for example, if we set the block size to 32 bytes, the hash for each block is a fixed size of 46 bytes. So storing a single block in, in our store would require 240% more space than the block alone. <laughs> so that's really inefficient, obviously. OK. So every non-leaf node must store pointers to its left and right child. So storing a single I, non- uh, What's that? Actually, I have a viewer's uh, remark that you said it's exponential growth, but I think it's just one over x. Yeah, 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 I guess you're right. It's... Sorry. <laughs> um, anyway, so storing a non-leaf node um, uh, takes up 430% uh, more space because you've got um, three hashes uh, then, uh, then a single uh, block. Anyway, so finally, the smaller the block size, the deeper the tree. So the x well the one over x I guess uh, growth uh, uh, really makes sense because of the uh, because it is is the the amount of space required grows as the block size gets smaller. Okay, so after bottoming out at about fifty six kilobyte block size right here, um, we see that the Merkle DAG begins to increase in size again, going to the right. Um, that this is it, as block sizes increase. What's happening here is we're now seeing it being influenced by um, a block duplication. So um, at 58 kilobytes, we have a lot of duplication of blocks. Um, so if two blocks are identical in the Merkle DAG, then we store references to a single block in the tree, but the contents of the block is not duplicated in the store. Um, so as our block size continues to increase, the percentage of du duplication decreases. Uh, causing the size of our Merkle DAG to increase. Um, you'll notice there is an anomaly at about 83 kilobytes, kilobytes block size. I'll talk about that in a bit. Okay. At about 498 kilobyte block size, which is huge, um, there's a uh, for blocks. There's a peak here, and the size of our Merkle DAG begins to decrease again. Now what we're seeing is the influence from the lack of Merkle DAG overhead, I, I, I believe is what's happening here. As our block size get bigger, uh, the depth of the tree shrinks and we begin storing less and less overhead. Um, and if we continue the graph to the right, we see that the size of the Merkle DAG actually approaches close to the actual size of the file of 17 megabytes, which is this, yeah, is, um, because it, as, it, as there's, I mean, for example, if we made a set our block size to 17 megabytes, all we would be storing is one giant block. <laughs> and, the, and it's the root of the tree, and there's nothing else. So as we move to the right, it, it, we gradually lose overhead of the tree, and it becomes very small. Uh, so in summary, see here, starting from the, the right side, as the block size decreases, the overhead of generating the uh, the, uh, the overhead of generating the um, uh, the Merkle DAG increases in size until we reach a tipping point where increasing block duplication, flipping the other way, um, causes the size of the Merkle DAG to decrease. And finally, as we approach um, zero block size, our Merkle uh, DAG increases rapidly in size due to the excessive overhead of the, of storing a, a tree with such small blocks. To the point to take note of is right there, that low point. Uh, before we start to feel the influence of the growth of the of the growth of the Merkle DAG of small blocks, and at the minimum point uh, where we see the most duplication of blocks. Uh, 
Um, the optimal block size for this simulation is about 58 kilobytes. And like I said, that's for this simulation. Um, interestingly, if you look at the next slide, the, the default IPFS block size is 256 kilobytes, um, which is not in the optimal range of this simulation. But the, of course, the thing to keep in mind is that the optimal block size is going to be heavily dependent on the contents of the data file, since it, since it depends on, on, on that at which block size the most duplicates are seen. So our low block or, or our um, a minimum here um, could be just due to the nature of the file that I tested. It might be more interesting if I tested more uh, more files, but I should point out that it took hours to get just this data on a single file. This was well more than hours of actual runtime. It was uh, I had to run it overnight multiple times, and yeah, it takes a lot of overhead. I will probably add more data to this before um, I'm actually presenting on this in again for for something else. But anyway. So it would be more interesting to see more data files tested and uh, to see if I could come up with a a more universal um, uh, minimum. So now about the anomaly in the data, the anomaly at this peak right here. Um, well, here I can I can draw, can I? I don't even know how to do that. Well, anyway, there we go. Going to draw. So right here, <laughs> that anomaly. I have no idea what this might be, but I suspect it has something to do with the test file. And testing more data files would, would give me a better idea. Ah, interesting. Jeff Mahoney's comment is very interesting, that it pegs the, uh, so, um, uh, that file du block level duplication pegs the sweet spot at 64K to 128. That's interesting. Okay. Um, so I believe what's happening here is this is very, this, uh, this anomaly is very dependent on the, um, on the data file. And actually, if we go back and look at the, uh, the original data, that's not just looking at the valleys, the, this anomaly is actually more pronounced on the top of the valleys. Um, so, uh, so it, it's actually requesting more data than it's really uh, is really uh, visible here, but but yeah, so there's definitely an anomaly there, and I think it's because right in that sweet range, uh, in that range right there, there's uh, this just this spot where um, there's very few duplicates of blocks on that file. I believe is what's happening, and I need to test that, and I'll uh, I will be testing that later. Okay, now to wrap all of this up. Um, I told you I, I also collected other data points. And to be honest, the other data points were not that interesting. <laughs> the results of the optimum block size for upload time, for example, suggest um, blocks of at least 50 kilobytes. So anything above about 50 kilobytes right in this range here um, is, is fine. Actually, 50 kilobytes is more like right there. Um, so the uh, so the upload time uh, uh, follows that same curve, um, uh, and uh, it increases dramatically as as the, the smaller the block size, since we send more packets. So similar to when uh, when our uh, Merkle DAG increases in size rapidly as our as our blocks get smaller, in this case our our upload time is is slowing dramatically as we're sending packets in rapid time. Anyway. The more packets to stand, the more overhead we'll have. And then the download time, pretty similar also. There are these weird anomalies here and here. And I actually re-ran the test multiple times, and they still did that. I have no idea why. Um, but yeah, it pretty much follows that same pattern. About, um, about 50 kilobytes in size is is where I found is uh, is the optimal, or yeah. And then the ledger update time, pretty similar also, also showing that same kind of pattern. Um, and again, it's right around 50 kilobytes that it's and, and above that is uh, is considered optimal according to this simulation. All right, and then. Just some citations for my uh, using Brownsworth's um, 
demos there. And uh, that's it for me. Any questions? I appreciate the feedback in the in the chat. That's been um, nice to see some of those comments. Actually, I would like to ask Jeff if he could explain it more, because if I understand it correctly, if this is the sweet spot for the deduplication, shouldn't the tree be the smallest in this range? Or is it just a weird coincidence anyway? Yes, I did use jumbo frames, <laughs> Andreas asks. Uh, oh, interesting. OK. Yeah, it could. the spikes could be caused by the fragmentation in the jumbo frames. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. And also, Sorry, when... I needed to attach my mic. Um, OK. From what I've seen in the dedupe stuff, uh, it seems to be, uh, well, it's it's been across file systems. Um, so it's not necessarily related to overhead. It tends to be the sweet spot uh, overall that is the trade-off between maximum deduplication and fragmentation. So that if you end up deduplicating all over the place, you'll end up with this file that's Swiss cheese that uh, once you actually try to read it, read it linearly, your performance just goes to hell because you're seeking all over the place. Um, that makes sense. So I'm not surprised that it's showing up as overhead in other ways. So like when you have your um, Merkle DAG overhead, um, that I mean that curve is, is uh, pretty typical, um, but it's interesting that it, it translates that way. Um, Michael, is that more or less what you're asking, or? Uh, yes, uh, thanks. I did not realize the thing with the fragmentation. So it is, uh, yeah, it matches now for me. Any other questions? I'll make another comment on the jumbo frames. Something else that I was doing was, uh, obviously, I had some that were just ginormous packets that were even larger than 90K. And so then at that point, I was actually having to chunk it up on my own. And that might have caused some overhead also. So I was having to chunk the giant blocks to be able to send them in jumbo frames even because they were even larger than the frames. Just comment on that. Um, in regards to Andreas' question. Well, I think that does it then. Uh, thanks everyone for attending and participating.